Hi, welcome to Down to the Root. Hi, welcome to Down to the Root. I'm your host, Bethany Jean, and today in studio we have the amazing Troy Baker. Wow, the amazing, I'm like a superhero. We don't even know how to intro you because there's so many titles. So how would you introduce yourself? Oh, amazing is a good way to start. Um, the also whirlwind. Whirlwind is better. Keep going. Pull out <laughs> words. Just let's open up the dictionary and see what falls out. Let's look the, up synonyms for amazing. I always like the inimitable because it's hard to say. The inimitable feels like that's what a stroke feels like. It's trying to say inimitable. Um, I, actor, um, a lot of people would know me from some of the games that I've been in. The Last of Us. Was, Last uh, of Us, huge yeah, cult huge following. Um, I got to play the Joker um, in several iterations, which was a, for me as a, as a nerd growing up, a comic book nerd and a um, animation nerd, the Batman the Animated Series show in the 90s was a big reason why I got into this business in the first place. Um, director, I've, I've been able to direct a few things. I'm working on a couple projects that I can't talk about right now, but uh, I got to direct uh, Lord of the Rings game Shadow of War, which is a lot of fun. So cool. I learned a lot on that. And you're also a musician. And I'm a musician. Um, I started off in music, and I thought that that was kind of be how... I like um, made my dent in this world. I was gonna light the world on fire with my music, and it turned out the world was like, no, that's not what, at all what you're gonna do, um, because it's incredibly hard to make money at music. And so I made the obvious logical decision to do a more stable career and do become an actor. But this came to you very naturally, as not all people fall into voiceover acting. They for kind sure. of push that door open for I you. think, well, yeah, I think everybody stumbles backwards into it because nobody, I don't, I haven't met a single person um, within the last, you know, 15 years, whatever, it's like, I went out to LA to do this. Um, it was, I want to go do uh, TV, I want to be in film, and I guess I could pick up a job doing this while I'm at it. But you actually started doing voice voiceover acting in Dallas. Yeah. So I in moved your youth. from okay. in my youth. <laughs> uh, I moved from Texas and I was doing car commercials. Like I while we were doing an really? album. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've got to see these. Far worse. Pulling they, these out of the archive. I'm sure they live somewhere on the internet and you can find them. I uh I I was I was in a band, and we were doing our um, Wait, album what's at the, the name studio. of your band? Oh, this band is no, long gone and defunct. Um, you can't find it on the internet? You probably There's could. Nothing. Trip Fontaine, two peas, have fun. Go deep dive <laughs> Go in the, it, into the Googles. Um, I, 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 we were doing our album at the studio that also did a lot of commercial work, and so they were off cutting drums or doing whatever that didn't require me, and so I just wandered through the halls, and I was like, hey... You guys doing radio spots? I'm like, yeah, get out. And so two weeks later, I got a call. They said, if you still want to do this, uh, get down here and let's see what you can do. And so I walked in and I just did what I'd always heard on the radio growing up. Like, this Sunday, 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 that whole thing. I realized you don't have to say Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. They actually will do <laughs> They'll duplicate it for, for you. you. So that was the first, first lesson that I had. But you were really built for this, though. I think so. I can't imagine you not being in this world. Well, I can't imagine me not being in this world either. It's like an alternate universe. But as far as like this, <laughs> yes, the, in, in this, this industry. Uh, industry, yeah, there was there have been versions of myself that have that have I've done the corporate nine to five job. Um, I've I've uh, I've waited tables. I've done everything in between. My first job was at a dry cleaners. So, you know, related field. Oh, you probably have some good tips and tricks. I have none. That should be a um, hack. It is. It is Laundry hacks. Yeah, laundry Troy hacks. <laughs> uh, just make sure you clearly separate and tell people, this is not to be laundered. This is to be dry clean. Because you have idiots like me working there going, I don't know, man. I'm just putting this thing into a bag and someone's doing something else with it. What's um, the weirdest job you've ever had? <laughs> uh, the weirdest job? Maybe, I mean, we could, we could go dark if we wanted to, but um, probably selling perfume uh, out of my car where literally oh, I, so I hear good. snickering, how <laughs> dare you, 
It's a noble profession. It absolutely is not. Um, I, By the way, that might be a Texas thing because I'm pretty sure my brother did that when he lived in San Antonio. It is. It is a. It, the company owned it is a mafia company for sure. Oh my gosh. Um, they. Uh, you would leave on a Sunday, early on a Sunday, and our our territory was West Texas. You know, mm -hmm. all the people there that need cologne. And by the way, this is not, this was like, hey, do you like whatever you're wearing? Mm. Well, I've got a bottle here. <laughs> smells you're gonna just love like you're going to love it. <laughs> um, and I'm going to sell it to you for $60. Yeah, I know that's more than what you pay, but, and we, we would, we would drive out on Sunday and we'd come back Saturday night with no money. And there was like, you have to pay for your own hotels. You have to pay for your own gas. You have to pay for your own food. Uh, and you better come back with the right amount of money between what you made and the bottles that you sold because we're going to settle up. And it was this horrible job like that it, it was extortion dealer. and the exploitation <laughs> of, of young, stupid people like me. But then there were people that was like, I'm making $150,000 a year. I don't know how. Uh, they were selling drugs on the side or whatever. So that was a weird job that I had that I did not keep for too long before I was like, this is... Yeah, this is slavery. Shady. This is shady, <laughs> this to is say slavery. the least. Oh my goodness, that's super funny. Okay, so how old were you when you got into voiceover? I I think my first job, I was probably like 25, maybe, something like that. And they um, saved you from perfume slinging? Yes. Yes, it was, yeah, probably about 20, 25, 26, maybe. I think is when uh, that started that started taking off and and people started hiring me to to sling whatever. And I remember like there was a time and period, especially following 9/11, uh, where the big thing was car dealerships were offering zero down, zero percent interest for 60 months, basically selling you the car, just take the car, and because <laughs> nobody was buying anything, and so for a guy like me, I was like making so much money off of them telling us like come buy this 2000 escort please <laughs> just give us dollars and you can have it um or no dollars for quite a while yeah and it was like everybody was like you nothing says america like a ford f-150 <laughs> you know and just like if you're truly an american because that's it's it's kind of revealing about who we were as a culture especially then was like hey you don't feel like america right now why don't you go buy some stuff <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you know that you're an American is if you're a consumer. I love it. I love it. Um, is there anything about yourself that you feel is misunderstood or is there anything you wish that people knew about you? Hmm. Great question. Yeah. I think that I suffer, hmm, suffer may be too hard of a word. I think that I, in my earlier years, <laughs> I had a tendency to project a version of myself that I thought was what people wanted to see. And I didn't consider that that echoes mm -hmm. throughout. Like as you maintain relationships with these people that aren't in your inner circle, that aren't in your outer circle, they're kind of on the fringe, but you still, the people that you work with, mm -hmm. there's stupid things that I've done and behavior that I displayed in sessions um, a funny story. So I'd worked with Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker, and Joker uh, a couple of times. And it was like one session and then I worked with him again. And we had like hung out backstage. We were talking about the Beatles and the Stones and he's a huge Kinks fan. So we were talking about music. We just bonded. I, I want to be a fly on the wall in that conversation. It was a, I was just, I can't believe I'm having this conversation with this guy right now. So two, three weeks later, we're in a completely different session, completely different studio, completely different job, and he walks in. And I go, buddy, and walk up and give him a hug. And what I don't see is that him looking at the director like, who is this guy? And I made a fool out of myself uh, because my arrogance thought that you can't assume that that, it was just a Tuesday to him and he was talking about stones or anything else. What a minute. To me, it was me meeting my idol, you know? So yeah. it, there's a different context and a different conversation that he had with me than I had with him. So I, I feel like there's, there's, uh, there's even a director that I just worked with not that long ago who I walked into the studio and he goes, I'll be honest with you, 
I thought that you just knew how to work a room and that somehow had perpetuated yourself into getting jobs in a career. And after we worked together, he was like, I understand why you get the jobs that you do. And it was a great compliment uh, that I took graciously. But I think that because I'm a big personality, um, I think that there is a misconception about who I really am and what's really important to me. Mm -hmm. And I can't worry about that. Um, because on my left arm is tattooed uh, the Greek phrase, genote sauton, and forgive me if I'm saying that incorrectly, uh, you're a swath of Greek audience. <laughs> um, but it means know Don't thyself. Don't call them out. Yeah. <laughs> it means know thyself. And I have it on my left arm because I'm right-handed, so this is my weak arm. And whenever I feel weak, I it's that. because I'm wrestling with my identity. And if you know yourself, and if your version of yourself, your narrative is stronger than anybody else's, then it doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. So while I make sure that I'm operating in a way that's not dissonant with others, and I try to be a social animal that is in harmony with other people, I don't worry too much about what they think or what they feel about me. Um, but to answer your question, I, I, if there's something that's misunderstood about me, if there's something that I would hope people understand, it's, it's that. That when you see me, I am truly trying to be the best version of me that I can be. That's ideal. Yeah. I love your tattoo. I love that you have it on your weaker arm. Yeah. I believe in a uh, placement for, for tattoos for sure. If you were to be remembered as talented, <laughs> kind, hmm. wise, or original, what's the hmm. most important for you? Of those words, I think it's, I have to caution myself with um, the notion of being remembered. Um, because it immediately plays to a, a why do I care? Mm -hmm. Why am, am I erecting statues um, in my honor? Does it matter what people, how people perceive me? Well, you're going to have a family lineage regardless. Well, so what like I think fanship I fanship out of it even then. Yeah, I, I like funneling that notion into um, how will my son remember me? Yeah. And, and what aspects of me will he carry into his life? Because that's really the only legacy that I care about. Um, my work is too subjective. People will look at my work and go, ah, eh, it was okay, or oh, it was amazing. But it doesn't change what I did. It's just the perception that they have of it. But I think more than anything, of those words that you mentioned, original is a great one. Um, but I think kind. Mm -hmm. I just... I just want Traveler to be kind. Mm -hmm. um, and he already is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's incredibly kind. Um, it's in his DNA. It's in his DNA. And, and that's, you know, there's learned behavior and there's inherent behavior. Mm -hmm. And already inherently I see in him um, facets of a good man. And that makes me very happy. He's lovely. And, and his mom mm -hmm. is about as sweet as they come. Yep. Um, I mean, you kind of already answered this, but for, for your great, great grandchildren, what do you hope they hear of you? Just that you were kind? Yeah, I think that. Because I think you're all of these things. I think, Thank you. I think you're wise and talented you. and original, and um, I'm sure you'll be remembered for all of them. My great, great grandchildren, if they knew that I existed, that would be enough. You know, I mean, we, because how far back can you trace your family? Like, I can go back to my great grandfather, mm -hmm. um, but I know his name and, mm -hmm. and that he lived, and that's about it. And I don't know. The rest kind of becomes family folklore, right? Kind of. Yeah, same. I get a little confused about who's who and what family member became, you know. But I don't know. What branch that is. There was a time where that, that's, that's what that meant. You know, you. If your last name was Smith, and that meant that that's, that's the profession that your yeah. great, great, great grandfather had. Mm -hmm. And that tells you something about yourself. I don't know. Look, I am a far cry from my dad. Um, and so I don't know how important the parental roles that were given to us, the home life that was given to us, plays into um, 
who we are as people. I would like to think that me being a good father will help set Traveler up for success. Um, and that we work hard to give him a good home life so that life's hard enough and he doesn't need to have that be a component of his struggle. He's gonna have all of his own challenges. But if me as a dad, if I can just make sure that he doesn't make my mistakes, he can make his own, but I just don't want him to make my mistakes. I can so relate to that. Cool. I can very much relate to that. Um, are there any other career ventures or passion projects you'd love to take a stab at? Yeah, uh, I really, really love directing. I yeah. love directing. Um, it's, it's a challenge. It's a exercise in humility um, because I think a lot of people, and I looked at it this way too, that directing meant control, uh -huh. and it is the absence of that. It is the surrendering of that notion of control. Um, I heard Steven Spielberg say in a documentary about himself, um, he casts directors. So his job is to direct directors. So he's yeah. a director of acting, a director of photography, a director of wardrobe, a direct, as opposed to, because not one person can do everything. We don't have, the world cannot suffer another Orson Welles. Mm -hmm. And I look at true leadership and true, um, the ability to um, direct well is when other people aren't doing your vision, they're doing theirs, they're just aligned. Mm -hmm. And if you can allow people to participate enough in your vision of something to where they have such ownership that they're like, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not doing what he told me to do, I'm doing what I wanna do, yeah. but it's all the same vision, that's it, that's it. So directing really leads to that. Um, we're, my buddy and I, Nolan North, who's uh, a great actor in his own right too, and has kind of found a great niche for himself in video games and animation as well. Um, he and I are sitting down in, in something similar to where we're creating content for and, and trying to build a community, uh, predominantly of gamers, people in nerd culture. To, and you have your podcasts. Yeah, so that's it. It's Retro Replay. Retro Replay, it's a, a lovely little show that we do where we sit on a couch uh, once a week and we kind of play a video game, but it's really just about us dialing into each other and what's going on in, in our lives. Like we play- So brilliant, I it's love fun. this concept. I think we did seven, we did Rambo three and we did seven minutes of that. Um, and the rest of it was spent about all manner of tangents. But the, I, the idea of it is it's not about the game, it's about the hang mm -hmm. and it's about what happens, why we play games and what happens when we play them. Right. And the unspoken rule is that Nolan and I don't get off the couch until we've learned something about each other. And so after years of friendship with this guy, I'm still constantly learning things about him. I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, where can everyone find you? You can find me on the internet. I'm fairly accessible there. Uh, Troy Baker VA on the Twitters and official Troy Baker on the Instagram. Uh, we'd love for you to come hang out with us on Thursday on Retro Replay. It's uh, youtube.com forward slash Retro Replay, at Retro Replay Show on social. Um, Thursday, every Thursday we do a live chat mm -hmm. for 3.30 uh, p.m. Pacific, and then the episode goes live on 4 o'clock, and then we do audio podcast of, of all of our shows throughout the week. I love it, and you guys have such great fanship. Yeah. It's so cool. Well, all of these can be binge watched, um, all of these episodes at the EverTalk app, as well as Apple TV and Roku. So Troy, thank you so much for coming. It's truly my pleasure. Yeah, it's been so fun to have you. Thank you.